Welcome back, everyone, to the Open Web Forum at COGX, curated by Fabric Ventures. Now, you might have heard of CryptoKitties or Beeple's $69 million JPEG, but what is really going on with NFTs and where might value accrue? Moderating this panel is Robert Norton. Robert was CEO and co-founder at Sachi Art, the world's largest online gallery, before occupying the same role at Sedition Art, one of the first online platforms for collecting digital art, featuring such names as Damien Hurst, Shepard Ferry, and Yoko Ono. Robert's latest venture is Verisart, a blockchain-based authentication service for both physical and digital artworks. I can think of genuinely no better person to lead this discussion at the intersection of art and technology. Over to you, Robert. Thanks so much. Um, well, very excited to be moderating this panel, uh, which brings together a range of people uh, from um, production finance for NFTs to um, artists working in NFTs um, and authenticated marketplaces, um, as well as consensus around pricing for NFTs. So I'm going to introduce the panelists briefly. Um, Nick Rose, uh, founder and CEO of Eternity. Uh, Nick's a Greek investor and entrepreneur, uh, also a self-confessed environmentalist, rose to prominence as a creator of Pray for Amazonia hashtag in 2019. Um, and his uh, company, uh, Eternity, um, is uh, specializes in authenticated NFTs with world-renowned icons. Welcome, Nick. Um, also on the panel, I have um, Sarah Mayohas, uh, one of the uh, real pioneers uh, from the art world in embracing blockchain technology uh, in the launch of her uh, famous Bitcoin uh, project um, back, I think, Sarah, is it 2015 or 2016? Was, was that is that right? 2016, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, and recently, of course, uh, resold <coughs> Philips Auction House. Um, Sarah investigates the complex operations that increasingly govern our world, um, and whether these are soaring birds using augmented reality software, flocks in unison, rose petals, uh, and other extraordinary sort of data sets uh, melding the natural world and the AI equivalent. So, excited to have you on the panel. Thank you, Sarah, for joining. Bring us on to Kurt Braggett. Kurt is Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of NFT Genius. Before founding the company, he worked for 15 years as a software engineering, uh, as a software engineer in shipping web and mobile applications for corporate products to niche block blockchain products. Uh, in addition to co-founding Popstad Inc., an LA-based software company, Kurt has architected a number of applications in blockchain and crypto space, including Chirp.LA. He's a serial entrepreneur who's been financially backed by Tim Draper and Lionsgate Entertainment, among others. Um, Nick, welcome to the panel. And finally, uh, Nick, uh, sorry, Kurt, welcome to the panel. Apologies. And ready on to Nick. Nick Emmons, finally, co founder and CEO of Upshot. Upshot's a platform for crowdsourced NFT appraisals. Uh, previously, Nick led blockchain engineering at John Hancock and Manulife, where he started one of the first public blockchain projects to come from a large institution. Well, welcome everybody and thanks uh, for joining the panel. As you know, I'm going to um, kick off briefly by asking you not to reintroduce yourselves in the same way I have, but perhaps to just tell us about how you got started in the NFT space and your most recent developments. And I'm going to ask you all to keep us under two minutes each. Um, so please, uh, Nick, uh, welcome to the stage. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I've been in the blockchain since 2010, so it's been about 11 years since I got involved with the uh, blockchain in general. I got introduced to the NFT space around 2017. Obviously, CryptoKitties was you know, a pioneer project and led us all to see what's going to happen in the future. So I've been working in Eternity since then. Uh, it was just an idea, and, and uh, the reason we started Eternity was um, we were always seeing so many F uh, NFTs out there. Um, and th the thing that I thought it was missing was authentication and scarcity. Uh, we would see companies using celebrities, athletes, and selling their emails. So we thought that we want to fix this. So we came up with Eternity, which is only focusing into authenticated NFTs, fully, fully licensed, um, exclusively, um, either it's sports, music, um, film, and, and, you know, we have about 12 collections and um, we launched this March 2021. 
Great. And can you tell us a little bit about why um, you use stones and, and the value of the social token within your Eternity platform and also a little bit about Uniswap and how you're using that? Yes. So we created Earn, which is uh, our native token, because we want to give exclusive um, access to our community. Our community is about 120,000 people um, since we launched. And um, DeFi is another side of Eternity. We're not just an NFT project. Uh, we're an NFT DeFi application, which by owning our social token, you can stake it and in return, you farm stones, you know, yield farming and something DeFi applications came up with. So the stone farmers, as we call them, get exclusive access to real life events. Um, we gave out uh, Euro 2020 tickets and uh, meetups with celebrities, uh, Zoom calls with celebrities. Um, we're also building virtual world, a virtual world which hasn't been announced yet. It's going to go live uh, within the summer. And due to, through the virtual world, you'll be able to redeem experiences using stones, which is like points. Great. Well, we're going to come back and talk about how you build community in the space of NFTs in, in a second. But Sarah, um, um, please tell us what you've most recently been up to and uh, um, yeah, how you see really your um how, how you see the world having evolved right from your kind of like first sale of bitcoin back in 2015 2016 to your most recent sale uh at phillips earlier this year yeah so when i came up with bitcoin in 2014 um i had never heard the word smart contract i never heard the word ethereum um and the project bitcoin is itself an artwork that trends i was seeing with the financialization of art People turning themselves into brands, and this recent technology that we thought was totally fascinating. Um, to create an artwork that took these trends to an extreme, and that's kind of how I came up with Bitcoin. Uh, art has a very long history of being in relationship with gold, and gold has a relationship with Bitcoin. And like the idea of this of a, an altcoin that was backed at a fixed rate by my artwork was the proposal. Um, now, looking back, this artwork becomes incredibly prescient as like, quote, you know, a kind of proto NFT. So we recently did a set sale of, um, of Bitcoins backed by physical rose petals, which without going into too much detail are essentially my version of gold. They're the proof of work of a much larger project I did called Cloud of Petals where I had 10,000 roses, 16 men being in photographing all the petals, entering a data set using AI, etc. The point is, these petals are a relic of this giant project. And what this new Bitcoin sale was proposing is to separate essentially the stewardship of the artwork from its ability to transact financially with like a press panel that is difficult to um, or difficult to exchange. So that's that's what I've been up to. Great. All right. Well, thank you. And um, Kurt, tell us a little bit about um, how things are going over at uh, NFT Genius. <clears throat> yeah. So yesterday we just announced that uh, we we uh, raised some money from uh, Mark Cuban and, and Pomp and a few other people like Ashton Kutcher. Um, and really what we've been working on is storytelling on the blockchain so um, and NFTs particularly. So we created a set called Bitcoin Origins that um, is really about telling the story of Bitcoin, something that's really dear to me and, and our team. Um, I've been in Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies for about 10 years and kind of went through all of the uh, different events myself. Um, so telling the story uh, through NFTs uh, has been a really fun thing and that thing flies off the shelves so we, we've pretty much sold out um every release of our nfts in just a few seconds or even milliseconds and we've been able to do i think it's about five million in total volume now um and we are kind of moving along to other uh sets we have about five different ips that we're working on some of them are like huge movies um and uh, we also have a music-based nft technology and marketplace that we're, we're uh, releasing on Flow. So we're really excited about that. 
That's great. And did you receive, I saw you had Roham on your, uh, one of your investors. Is, is that also through Dapper Labs or was he investing personally alongside the other well-known investors in your round? Yeah. I mean, so him and another executive really believed in what we we're doing. And so, you know, I, I think it is technically through Dapper, but he's very, he's personally very supportive. So I was really excited about that for sure. That's great. Congrats. Um, and just in terms of like the price point of these NFTs, what have been the most expensive uh, NFT that you've sold? And have you sold it through um, your site directly or have you worked with a marketplace or a facilitator like uh, Origin or, or, or others? I'm curious to sort of understand how you actually sold the works. Yeah, we, we write all of our own smart contracts and we build all of our own marketplace technology. Uh, I've built marketplace technology maybe across like 10 blockchains now. Um, it's it's more reliable if you roll your own because a lot of these sales, you know, even Top Shot like fails or something. And so we, we like to roll our own um, and we haven't had any failures at all in, in any of our sales. So it's pretty cool. But the highest priced one is uh, we sold one for 450,000 USD. So that was like a really big deal for us. Um, and that was one from the origin set. But, you know, they range between, you know, like a few thousand to you know, upwards of a, hun a few hundred thousand. And what, what made is that the Bitcoin origin set? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah. What made that one stand out, do you think? Like what were the kind of magic ingredients? Uh, was it the timing? Was it around March, April uh, this year? Uh, or was it there specifically kind of ingredients around that NFT that you think kind of- Yeah, helped? I think it's the timing. So, sorry, I couldn't hear you on that last part, but but I, I think that it that it was it was timing really, you know, and I, I think that it goes into something deeper, which is like attracting the right kind of whales and attracting the right kind of money to your project, which is, you know, obviously very important in art too. I, I've been involved in huge art sales where, you know, they sell millions and you have to really uh, know how to attract the right kind of whales because it's a very niche market. So attracting mm -hmm. whales um is you know a talent that you probably need in, in this industry for sure all right well that's a great uh, segue to bring us on to nick uh who um tell us a little bit about um about upshot and and how you're kind of helping people understand better pricing or fair pricing for for these nfts and and what you do beyond uh aggregating the transaction history that's on chain yeah, so I, I think like the the last great blocker for NFTs to kind of, before NFTs can kind of progress to their next level of adoption and growth is this issue of price discovery. You know, it's it's no secret that it's really difficult to price these things, and a lot of that comes from sort of the inherent traits of NFTs as an asset uh, class themselves. They are non fungible, low velocity assets. That means they don't change hands very often. And these transfers of ownership that act as sort of price discovery events for other types of assets just don't happen enough for the open market to actually price NFTs efficiently. And so when you look to similar types of assets, I guess in the real world, you see things like real estate and physical art relying very heavily on uh, things like appraisals, the querying of experts' opinions about what they're worth, because this doesn't violate that core property of, of these assets being low velocity. And the problem with that, obviously, is that appraisals in that setting rely heavily on identity, on firms, on reputation, on these things we don't have abundant access to in a decentralized, pseudonymous setting. So a lot of what we've been building is on top of this new field of game theory called peer prediction, which focuses on incentivizing people to be honest in the face of subjectivity. So experts leverage upshot. They they uh, uh, kind of answer questions about what they think different NFTs are worth and they're rewarded based on how honestly they answer those questions. So that's what we're building. And, and with this, it removes that requirement for them to change hands. And so we can create these close to uh, real time price feeds for NFTs leveraging appraisals. And um, the, is the rewarding of the participants in your community, is that done through a social token or how can you talk a little bit more about how, how those mechanics work? Sure, yeah. So. People can pay for NFT appraisals in whatever currency they'd like, DAI, USDC, uh, Ether, et cetera. And what is happening kind of under the hood is people's answers, uh, in this case, experts or NFT collectors, et cetera, their answers are being compared to each other and leveraging this 
new uh, peer prediction mechanism that's essentially analyzing the correlation or the mutual information admitted between answers, um, they are, are given a score that determines what their payment is. And the, the way to maximize the payment within this scoring mechanism is to be informed and honest, to actually expend effort to provide the honest answer to these questions. And so that's, that's kind of what's going on under the hood to ensure that the answers we're actually getting from these experts are honest and are informed, things like that. And what is the cost of an NFT appraisal for an NFT? Does it base, does it depend on what the last transaction was or is there a flat fee? Uh, it depends on supply and demand as, as with anything else. You know, if there is a high demand for NFT appraisals and a low supply of experts who can appraise those NFTs, then the cost is going to be higher if the inverse relationship is present. If there's a, a bunch of experts that have really informed opinions about the value of different NFTs, like maybe crypto punks, and there is a lower demand for the appraisals, or at least supply of experts outpaces demand, then it's going to be cheaper. So the appraiser receives some money for giving the appraisal? Uh, yep. Yeah, that's that's correct. The appraisers are getting paid to appraise these NFTs. Okay, and they get a percentage or a fixed amount? Uh, yeah, they, there's a, a fee. Just as if you get your home appraised, you're paying the appraiser a, a fee to appraise your home. In these, in these cases, you're paying the appraiser to appraise these NFTs for some sum of capital. And how's it going? How, uh, how Where are you in, in terms of the product rollout and how many appraisals have you done to date? Yeah, things are going great. We're rapidly expanding the sort of the collections of NFTs that are being appraised on the platform. We're establishing some pretty strong partnerships across the space and growing the kind of network of collectors that are appraising NFTs. So, so things are going quite well, yeah. Okay, let's talk about price then. So, um, you know, I shared with you all uh, some of the kind of recent press where we've seen, you know, what has been in the last few months uh, a decline on all fronts, right, in terms of price, active wallets, uh, number of NFTs um, that are being sort of uh, sold. So what is your own view around the recent correction? Um, and do you think we've bottomed out or, um, uh, or do you think we have further corrections to go? Uh, I'm going to kind of, anyone can take that. If not, I'll just, uh, I'll start with Kurt then. <clears throat> yeah, I, I feel like the, the reason why we're in the situation where we're at right now is because people are just kind of FOMOing and like YOLOing into uh, a lot of crazy stuff. And I think that it, it's just such a new thing for people that there was just so much FOMO that, you know, and, and also paired with the bull market, that's kind of my perspective on the pricing. And I think that people have sort of chilled out on it a little bit. And I think that that's also directly related to how much crypto they have. Cause if you see a lot of these purchases are obviously made with, with crypto. So, you know, the way that prices are going in the market, I think can affect that. Um, but I would say one of the insights in pricing right now that I'm seeing is that even though the, you know, the crazy bull prices have kind of gone down a little bit, uh, you still are seeing a lot of activity in NFT sets. You still see a lot of purchases. I mean, it has gone down a little bit, but it isn't going down the way people kind of expected it. They expected there to be kind of like this bear market but NFTs are a totally different thing. So I see it right now, this period is proof that it's decoupled um, pretty substantially from overall market pricing uh, of crypto. Sarah, how are you seeing uh, kind of pricing amongst your peers and, and, and your own work and your kind of uh, community of collectors in terms of the appetite for um, you know, purchasing uh, more NFTs or increasingly priced NFTs? Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, I also think that the crypto community is a lot, there is a lot of speculation in it, and NFTs certainly fed into that. Um, and I agree that, like, the price of, of crypto has a direct correlation to how many people are willing to spend then on the cultural asset that, like, reflects crypto. Um, I do think that there's so much money being poured in to basically the infrastructure to support NFTs, um, that this is just kind of a period of retrenchment. Uh, I also think that none of the platforms so far have done a job of promoting consumption as um, 
oh, I'm sorry, my speaker is loud. Uh, have promoted consumption. Um, you know, most of the platforms are all about the financial transaction. And so that like feeds into speculation. So as more infrastructure is built around consumption, I think that you can also see more broader kind of adoption by people who are not as interested in just greater fool, like speculating. Can you elaborate a little bit more what you mean by that in terms of the infrastructure around consumption? Are you talking about the collector experience of the NFT or, or something else? Yeah, I mean, when I speak to a few people who have NFTs, it's like they have to pull up like all these different apps to show me like a thing on their phone. Like it's not a good experience. And I'm talking right. to collectors who want to display something on their wall. They're all like trying out different screens, like which one can link properly. Like there hasn't yet been a really good uh, consumption experience built around it. Um, and, and the truth is that NFTs are a financial innovation, right? Uh, first and foremost, they're a financial tool to enable what is otherwise freely available information to actually have a financial value. So it makes sense that the first swing would be like, you know, a lot of people buying, uh, but now you need people using. Right, right. And, and Nick, in terms of Thernity, it sounds like you're doing quite a few different things there uh, in terms of, you know, staking your social uh, tokens and, and, and basically being able to earn on that. And that that that's, seems a really interesting area, which is this kind of intersection of NFT and uh, DeFi. What part of, uh, how much is that kind of the focus of your business versus the core marketplace activity of authentication and scarcity of, you know, well-known uh, um, individuals, uh, uh, and, and if you could just kind of like help us kind of understand, like, is it an equal focus? Um, and I'm going to ask you that specifically with regards to um, how you're seeing kind of your own experience on, on the marketplace side of things. Yeah, right now. great question. Uh, I think that the general, the general consensus of the market, I do not think we have enough collectors yet. And I'll give you a great example. If you see the highest NFT sales, it's the same 10 people. There's the same 10, 15 people who are paying those huge fees to buy expensive NFTs. Uh, I believe the rest are, are all investors and it's fully correlated with the correction because like Sarah said, the user, the user experience is not great. It stands for our marketplace as well. You know, you have to use MetaMask or, uh, or, or another wallet and you have to know how to buy the currency and you have to use your MetaMask and approve transaction. And, all these steps you need to, to to acquire an NFT. Obviously, there is marketplaces that you can use your credit card, right? But they're not fully decentralized. Uh, they doing it for you, and they hold your NFT, and they have custody of your NFT. Obviously, there'll be there'll, there'll be better tools, and 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 you know everything will get better with time. This is a brand new technology, um, and you know I'm I'm actually very very excited that because we're very early. This is the very early stage of NFT adoption. Um, and I believe in the next 10 years, um, NFTs will have utilities, they'll increase in value as art pieces and collectibles. Um, we've done the Muhammad Ali collection, the official Muhammad Ali collection. Everything, all the secondary uh, market are selling for more. Oh, we lost Nick there for a second. Um, going to um, circle back to, to you, Kurt. In terms of the marketplace that you've built, is, is, what, what chain did you choose and, and, and why? Can you give us a little insight? into into that yeah um i most of our early technology and and most of our sales came from wax um and there, there's a reason why we chose wax uh, they had a lot of experience uh with op skins and they already did a lot of uh gaming sales and they're an eos io uh based chain um and so you have lower lower fees um, and it's really suitable for gaming and they're very experienced in gaming and, and even the CEO uh, is the creator of Tether as well. It's like the most, you know, probably the most used cryptocurrency in the world, I would say. And so I, I put a lot of trust behind that in the beginning. And a lot of people underestimate Wax or aren't aware that there's, you know, there's dozens of multi-million dollar sets and there's huge transaction volumes and they're, they're significant. Um, like a game like Alien Worlds, for example, does millions of transactions and transfers of NFTs and does millions in revenue. 
there's land sales, there's pack sales. There's a lot of stuff that's going on on wax. That's really the future of NFTs. I think that a lot of like ETH or other chains are actually just going to follow exactly what wax did. Just some people aren't very happy with how the liquidity is there and people have worries about decentralization, but massive brands are already there. Um, and so I think it's just a matter of time before a lot of people kind of get separated into two camps, which is kind of already happening, but where you have high end pieces of artworks that, that don't move uh, very often. And then you have like gameplay assets um, where I think most of the industry is going to be in a few years is just mostly gameplay assets and high uh, transactions and then like higher forms of art that might be on Ethereum because Ethereum and 721s are kind of like the gold standard for artworks, I would say. Sarah, as an artist, do you see any issue in terms of being um, uh, presented alongside gameplay assets? Um, I'm thinking last week, the famous kind of Sotheby sale, you have a kind of crypto punk, which arguably is more of a digital collectible. And then many kind of like artists works, which had intended authorship, uh, were kind of sold alongside that. I'm curious as your own uh, view on that and whether or not it's a, a, a valid distinction or perhaps a kind of completely unnecessary one. You know, it's a valid distinction. Um, collectibles and art share characteristics, but they also have like really pointed differences. In collectibles are much more comparable and they have a hierarchy and this, you know, like CryptoPunks, you know, you have, they have individuality, hierarchy and community, but but in a collectible, the price is like a feature of the collectible. Um, and with art, like, unless the artwork is about the price, which sometimes in the case of Bitcoin it is, uh, the art should be separate a bit from the price. And, um, and so, for example, you know, the question of appraising for collectibles, I feel like it's a lot um, more straightforward. But how could you have appraised, you know, Beeple's $69 million artwork, like before the fact of the sale? Like that is, that's a very difficult task. Uh, and so I do hope that the NFT space kind of separates a little bit into a more fine art space, into collectible space, uh, because otherwise the conflation of the two really does a disservice to fine art, which actually does benefit from if not actual scarcity, an illusion of scarcity, uh, like most luxury goods. And knowing constantly what the price is, is not really, doesn't really make it um, that special. Uh, so that's a personal well, Thank you, and that's a great question for Nick. Nick, how would you have appraised uh, the $69 million uh, everyday 5,000 sale? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's tricky because of the sort of nascency of of the market at that time but the way you appraise art is like the most influential feature of an art appraisal in other words is the collectors that own the other pieces by that artist you know um it's it's the the artists are collecting collectors the same way collectors are collecting artists and and the really great artists in the world are the ones that are in the best collections in the world in the best museums and so i don't think it's a a uh, question of whether or not art is compatible with appraisals because fine art's been uh, like a, a pro like prominently appraised and, and regularly priced in the real world uh, since its inception. I think it's it's just a matter of uh, having to deal with the sort of nuances and ambiguity around pricing the art of artists newer to the sort of like transactional aspects of the art space. But I think. I, I agree that collectibles are easier to price because of this, these defined levels of rarity across defined traits, but it's important for us to actually understand what the value of art is. That's the only reason art can exist as an industry because there are market prices, because we're able to, to price these assets, et cetera. So if you look at the uh, parallels in the physical art market, you've got ArtNet, a well-known price database, which the auction houses themselves use, themselves use, even though they're the primary uh, sources of information supplied to that database. And then you have companies like NIR2 that do appraisal. Um, but appraising a NFT is substantially different from appraising a physical work. Um, which aspects of like NFT appraisal do you kind of focus on beyond other than just price? 
Um, what do you mean by that, I guess? Why is uh, appraising an NFT different? From well, so for example, um, you know, there might be a certain like time-based preservation media formats that certain kind of marketplaces will have NFTs that are a certain, you know, file size. Uh, there may be ways in which, you know, there's an omnibus wallet that's been associated with the purchase of the NFT. There may be, you know, other different uh, aspects. Um, do you look into that, um, those aspects, or are you really just looking at determining what the, what the price is for the NFT? And if you are just looking at just the price, um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what more you add beyond just the um, visible on-chain information for the price of those works themselves? Yeah, I, th I think there are a bunch of like really nuanced things that go into appraising art and and a lot of them aren't super influential in determining its value, the file type, the file size, etc. Really what it comes down to for determining an asset or a piece of art's uh, worth is artist provenance, it's the collections the artist is in. Those are really the most influential things that determine a piece. And that's consistent across physical art, that's, that's consistent across NFTs, those are what influence art and there's innovations in the style of art there are certain uh trends around the the sort of like mediums of art gifts may be hotter than stills one day and maybe pngs are hotter than jpegs etc but at the end of the day the most influential pieces are sort of agnostic to the medium and they are centered around who owns the other works by this artist and so that's that's really what a lot of appraisers are, are looking into when when pricing different NFTs in the in the art kind of category of NFTs. Collectibles obviously are different. There are many categories of NFTs. We're starting to see more financial instruments being, being uh, represented as NFTs. So an NFT representing an insurance contract is essentially just being uh, appraised, I guess, in a very abstract sense by actuaries or things like this. The, the sort of breadth of NFTs expands far beyond art. And so it makes it um, a, a very kind of multifaceted uh, appraisal process de depending on where the NFT lives within that spectrum. And do you offer advisory services beyond your appraisal? Like if someone comes to you and says, I want to spend $50,000 and I don't want to waste my money, what should I be buying? Um, no, not really. We're, we're trying to build the platform by which appra different appraisers of different types of, of NFTs can come and, and capture value from that expertise, capture value from those insights. So um, if appraisers want to come in and start uh, like pouring more resources into a given type of NFT, maybe offer consulting services on top of the, the kind of platform or adjacent to it, then they're welcome to. But we're really trying to create that, that platform for collectors, for appraisers to capture value in, in ways that aren't possible today. Okay, um, Nick, welcome back. So we lost you for a little bit. Um, you, uh, we were asking, uh, we, we, we turned to Kurt, but I wanted to ask you, what, what um, chain did you build your marketplace on? Uh, we're, we're on Ethereum and we're using Matic as a layer two uh, for now. Obviously, we were expecting Ethereum, Ethereum 2.0 to come out this summer, but as, as all the guys know here, that's not the case. So Ethereum for now, obviously, uh, you know, Kurt mentioned earlier, fail transactions sometimes you know you can't really do anything about that but yeah we're, we're, we're built on ethereum and in, in terms of the art community itself um do you feel or experience um uh kind of negative reaction to chains that are working off proof of work instead of proof of stake i'm kind of referencing the ecological concerns that oh yeah in the press recently yeah so me personally i have i've, I've been an environmentalist for about 15 years uh, i've been I've, i'm I'm on the board of uh, Rewild, which is uh, the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation. Um, I've, I've, I'm very active into the environmental community. So Eternity always uh, offset its emissions. After each drop, we have our own algorithm that calculates how much um, we have to donate to different organizations that offset our emissions. Uh, it's still very tricky. It's not very clear. Um, we are in the process to start our own environmental research to actually see what are the real the real numbers what does it take to mint an nft but but something i'm going to tell you uh, it's very very complicated to find out right right okay well look i'm, I'm very um uh, inspired by all these different kind of perspectives and i'm conscious that we've only got about five minutes left so i want to kind of just throw things forward 
Uh, it's not much of a huge crystal ball, but how do you think uh, NFTs are going to evolve from where they are now? Um, and obviously, you're all providing, you know, sort of unique services. You've got unique content. Um, Sarah kind of touched upon some of the kind of challenges around the consumption architecture. Um, but if we could kind of just like hear from you in terms of what you think are the, are the missing pieces uh, beyond just your own businesses. Obviously, you know, we'd expect appraisals to, to, to be something that you'll, you'll, you'll talk about, Nick, but perhaps you could just talk a bit more broadly in terms of the collector experience or in terms of just generally the, the quality of the NFTs. I think Kurt would be interested to hear from your own perspective in terms of like, what is the production capital that you advise brands now when thinking about building uh, a new NFT strategy? So perhaps we'll just uh, start with you, Kurt, and, and, and tell us a little bit about how you see the NFTs evolving and, and what kind of capital is required these days. Yeah, in, in, in the context of art, I feel like art is being disrupted. And that's, you know, most of the revenues that are coming in through this new media are like not traditional artists. I know that a lot of traditional artists are really gonna struggle to get in and we're kind of already seeing that a little bit. There's a lot of really promising things like you look at Palm or something like that with Damien Hurst and I think things like that will do quite well, but I think the game has changed. There's a new media and art is being disrupted and people are gonna have to find uh, a way to survive there. Just like in decentralized finance, a lot of traditional finance is just dead and it's gonna be disrupted and they're gonna have to try really hard to get into it. Um, I think an important thing for NFTs is staying power because right now people are kind of like YOLOing to JPEGs, but I think there's a new kind of uh, iteration that's coming out of this like, I see it as like a sort of micro bear where people are like, well, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Why are we buying so many fucking JPEGs or whatever, right? So what I think they're doing now is figuring out how to create real staying power, like ticketing, look at what Gary Vee is doing. Um, the, it's proof of ownership. And as MetaMask becomes kind of an SSO, like a universal login for the internet, you can ping really quickly what people own. And so to me, where this is really going is the staying power has to do with utility. And actually like in the same way that DeFi has taught a lot of us about traditional finance, I feel like NFTs are teaching us about traditional art, that you're actually not buying the art. Uh, I know a lot of people believe that they're buying the art, but I don't think so. And I think NFTs have really revealed that to me. Like when you hang a condo on your wall in your apartment, it's not about the art. It's about somebody else seeing it. It's about community. It's about connecting with people. There's a deeper meaning behind the art, but nobody could really afford it before it wasn't accessible. But now everybody's kind of learning that. So the future is how do you create staying power with your pieces? that they can be used over time and increase in value over time. And a lot of the way that's gonna be realized in my opinion is through DAOs and communities and, and utility. I'm conscious of time, so I wanna make sure everyone has a quick quick word. Nick, uh, Emin, so t tell us how, how, what, briefly um, you know, how you see it evolving. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of that. I think we'll see more utility get infused into these things. If it's on the art side or the music side or things like that, it'll be exclusive access to shows or access to the artists. And I think we'll just see this this space really explode at the intersection of DeFi and NFTs. NFTs are going to represent highly exotic, very esoteric financial instruments. And the, the kind of intersection between those two core pillars of crypto, I think is really the space to watch over the next couple of months to years. All right, Nick, quickly about one minute for you. Uh, both both guys fully covered me. I okay. fully agree with everything they said. Right. And we're, we're literally already doing most of those things. So I'm fully uh, let's hear from the artists as a, as a fi final word, Sarah, um, how, how, how's the next look? Well, you know, I think that, you know, right now we've focused on JPEGs, but art has so many more strange forms. And like, that's my dream for NFTs. Can, can you make an NFT make stranger forms of art uh, accessible to people? All right. Well, thank you so much for our, uh, giving us some sh your insights and uh, sharing what you're up to. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. This was fun. I'm glad Thank to meet you guys. Here. Nice to meet everyone. Mm. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody. Cheers, Robert. It's a shame we didn't have a couple extra hours to continue the discussion. But NFTs are actually the first sector I deep dived into after joining Fabric Ventures. And their applications across art, collectibles, gaming, DeFi, and beyond have intrigued me ever since. So I'd happily have listened to that all afternoon. 
Great job to both Nick, Sarah, and Kurt. I'll do my best to emulate the quality of this NFT panel for my own one that's coming up tomorrow. So rounding out the day, we have uh, digging into an adjacent industry to NFTs, which is music and how the open web can resolve many of its long-standing issues. This is the open web forum at Cogex, curated by Fabric Ventures, and I'll see you back here in 20 minutes.